virtually impossible to sustain faith in creative work alone, especially when a project extends over a long period of time. Harold Laswell coined the term resonators to describe what is needed. When something resonates, it vibrates at the same frequency as something else. Fundamentally, a resonator is someone who says, I hear you, I understand what you are trying to do. I'll help you get there. Diana Glyer. This is the Redeemed Imagination Podcast, a podcast of the Anselm Society on reenchanting the church. Welcome back to the Redeemed Imagination Podcast. I'm Brian Brown, and I'm joined by Father Matt Burnett, Lancia Smith, and Joel Clarkson today. And we are going to talk about the terrifyingly wide chasm between pastors and artists. Except we were skimming down the article that Phil Riken wrote a few years ago on essentially the opposite of our, well, satirically the opposite of our last podcast. Our last podcast, if you recall, was on how to make your church a more hospitable place for artists. Well, this article was on basically how to make your church a less hospitable place for artists. The thing is, as we were skimming over it, and we've mentioned this a couple of times and we wanted to dive into it, uh, we noticed two things. First of all, a number of the ways that uh, an artist will often feel uniquely alienated from community, from the church, from quote unquote normal people, a lot of those ways are actually more universal to human experience than one might think, or at least than they might think sometimes. The other thing we noticed is that actually a good number, probably half to two thirds of the things that Riken wrote as great ways to make the church a less hospitable or less healthy place for artists, something similar would apply to a pastor. There are very similar ways in many cases to make your church a less healthy place to be a pastor pastor, and to do a pastor's work. So we thought we would just go down the list together and hopefully encourage mutual understanding and have a little bit of fun along the way. So first thing on the list in the list of ways to keep your church as unhealthy and unhospitable for artists as possible is to treat the arts as window dressing for the truth rather than a window into reality. Okay, let's start there. What does that mean? Yeah, I think if I were to put it just a couple sentences on it, I'd say it's sort of a whole philosophy that's not just about the arts, but it's actually about the way we think about spirituality as a whole. It's sort of getting our faith stuck on our mind, as it were. And so because of that, because our faith ends up becoming about the concepts that we know and the things that we can repeat, the importance of art, then like other things in the church becomes about how it can represent that that sort of conceptualized thing, which is not to say that concepts aren't important, but simply to say that this sort of approach is to treat them as the only thing, as the only way of understanding truth or engaging with God. I'm kind of looking at this as maybe more of an invitation, really, into the idea of how we look at the arts being much more integrated into the way that we live, just simple living, that that's part of the way that we live. It's part of the way that we worship. If we move out of the idea of something being segregated into an act and more as a way of integrating and as a way of life, then we have a different picture of it. I guess i um, kind of trying to do what, you, what you're suggesting, Brian, by way of providing a pastoral perspective as well as an artist perspective. It seems to me that both from the sermon aspect of things— the sermon is, I guess, in our tradition, the Anglican tradition, certainly is critical and central to the worship of God because it's part of the proclamation of the Word of God. But it's not the only window into reality. In fact, the liturgy itself is a window into reality. The sermon is one pillar along with the table on which the whole thing stands. And so I don't expect my sermon to be the window into reality. I do expect it, though, to be a part of what God uses in the liturgy as we worship to take us into reality, the reality of encountering God. And so if it is a smaller part, along with the confession and meeting at the table and the Eucharistic prayer, I'm actually okay with that. 
Um, I don't want to be sort of dismissed as window dressing necessarily, but to be a smaller part of a bigger whole, I'm actually okay with. And so I guess I would say to the artist as well, if your art is a smaller piece that we're using to bring people into reality, but it's also a smaller piece of a bigger whole of worship that's taking us into reality, I guess I hope you would be okay with that. Mm. Well, it seems like you're running up there against an idea that we've talked about a little bit in the past, which is this dynamic where the art is perhaps undervalued uh, in its role as a window into reality and the sermon is correspondingly overvalued. When we run into this uh, with some regularity, actually, uh, this art versus sermons dynamic, we don't invent that dynamic. We run into it a fair bit in terms of churches that uh, deeply value the sermon and don't value art. And as a result, to some extent, you also end up with artists or appreciators of art who begin to even devalue the sermon and overvalue the art. It seems like there, there does need to be more of a, a balance here. Don't you think that that's kind of a reflection, though, of our heritage from Greek thinking, where everything has been split into its components? I mean, Greeks were the ones who began to break things down into elements. And before then, we had ways of looking very holistically at reality. And it seems to me like when we start looking at the elements of a worship service— that we're doing something similar where, you know, we're looking at making sure that it's done in a proper way and um, making sure that it fits the right time frame and that we've tried to cover all the bases. But it isn't always easy to take those pieces and then stir them together in a way that makes them feel like just one piece of a big whole or one whole thing. And it's easier to value art in the middle of that equally with the sermon, perhaps, or at least not as a subcategory, if we look at the experience as a whole thing rather than as a set of components. Do you think there's a danger there in over-specialization, not only in focusing on a, a given element of worship, but also viewing the artist or the pastor exclusively for a particular skill set? I mean, item three on Riken's list is to value artists only for their artistic gifts, not for other contributions they can make to the life of the church. I'm sure we've all seen churches where the pastor's primary perceived value is sermon making. Mm -hmm. Do you know, this is interesting because I think about, um, we keep on talking about, I think you're right to talk about the, the way Lancia in which we get lost in elements rather than the larger sort of whole. And I think we lose sometimes the sense that at the core of, the purpose of the sermon or the purpose of artistry, the purpose of anything else is Christ and mm-hmm. Christ as yes. the incarnate one who came to earth and accomplished this work on our behalf. And that, that point of incarnation is made very clear for us in the liturgy and, and that that includes both artistic expression and the sermon. And I think of a, there's a scholar named Robert Taft, a late scholar, a wonderful fellow who worked a lot on early liturgy in the church. And one of the things that he notes is that, is that there's this sense in which we see very clearly that, it, it, you know, when, when Jesus says that he comes not to abolish a lot of people, but fulfill it, that these types and these shadows and these rites that are very common become sort of fulfilled in Christ. But he says that, that it's not such a thing that they then end. It's that Christ, as the incarnate one who enters into our world, brings these things to bear in the entirety of reality so that in a sense, our whole lives, our whole world becomes a liturgical practice. And so when we think about the way that we practice worship in the church, that means that there is room for, as you say, Brian, not for these things to be at odds, but for them to be in partnership with each other toward this bigger end, which is encountering Christ and knowing him and walking with him. I'd say, Joel, that there's not only just room, but that that's the most natural way that that worship moves forward. Yeah. And by worship, I mean sort of liturgical and, and focused community worship. Absolutely. I think, it's, I think it's the most natural way that things move forward. In historical seasons or in personalities of churches or whatever, you may well have um, varying emphases, right, within that. But the most natural way forward, I think, is is an integrated sense, both within the worship service itself and as when he was the cardinal, Cardinal Ratzinger would say, both worship and a worshipful life, which are of a piece, but they're not the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And that's an integration of not just the world that we have that we're receiving internally, 
which is an important part of that is, is you know, our inner life, our prayer life, our, uh, you know, things that we, w- would relate very readily to uh, listening to a sermon, say, or to speaking some sort of prayer or text or something in the process of a church service, but getting our fingernails dirty with the tangible aspects of faith that allow us to recognize the way that incarnation works. It's, it's John one, it's the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's sort of the irreducible center of our faith, isn't it? In so many ways. Mm -hmm. Continuing down Riken's list, there's a couple here that I don't know that they necessarily have a, a corresponding side in the life of a pastor, but I'm going to throw them out there just in case you guys have see an angle I don't. First is embrace bad art. Tolerate low aesthetic standards, only value art or work, excuse me, that is uh, totally accessible rather than difficult or challenging. The second one is demand that artists give answers in their work, not raise questions. Do you guys see any corresponding uh, elements on the the pastoral side there, or should we just buzz past those? Because they're good in and of themselves, but as far as the conversation we're having here. Yeah. Maybe maybe I'll offer just a couple of bullet points, and if we want to take them forward, we can. If not, that's okay. Embracing bad art. I'm looking at this itself. So from the pastoral side, life is messy and church is messy. And so I tell people all the time, if perfect liturgy is what got us into heaven, then everybody on the planet just needs to go get coffee now uh, (laughs) because we're not going to do perfect liturgy. (laughs) Um, However, it doesn't mean that you do everything in a sloppy or bad way, nor does it mean that you worship, quote unquote, excellence. So whether it's preaching or weekly liturgy, to use an image, I don't remember where it came from, but you go for high quality weekly family work that God scoops up and by his Holy Spirit does amazing things, maybe looking for the periodic home run, right? And so I think it's similar then in both church and art. I think I heard Martin say something very similar, but well, um, fa- art at Holy Trinity, art, just real quick, art at Holy Trinity. Um, the Everybody, I think, recognizes that there's varying qualities within art. Mm-hmm. And I don't think an artist, say myself, is a bad poet, wants my bad stuff put up front. I want the good stuff put up front, actually. I'm embarrassed if my bad stuff is featured when the good stuff is out there. So I don't actually even want that. And yet, at Holy Trinity, we do try and give everyone, and this goes to another of points of Riken's, some exposure. But frankly, not right. all art should be front and center on Sunday morning. Some art should be in the hallway in a decorative sort of way. Because that's, it's, frankly, it's where it is. it shines the best. So similarly then in um, religious Go in religious situations. Yes, aim well. Don't be a lazy preacher. Don't be a lazy musician. Don't be a lazy anything. And yet recognize that week by week, it's the Holy Spirit's taking your efforts and doing something with them that brings us to God. Sorry, go ahead, Joel. Oh, I just wanted to pick up on what you're saying. I think that's you're making an excellent point. And I wonder in a very practical sense, if even just the step, it's just that small step, the communication from the pastor or the leadership team or the, whoever is speaking from the front to the community in terms of cultivating the community, even just the small step of going from, you know, the quality of what we do is not the the most important thing, but it does have import, you know, just even that small step opens up space for a conversation that it gets, I think very much into the, into something that has to do with the local community themselves there probably aren't things that we can apply across the board to every church in this regard, but just even that small step gives space for saying what kind of ecosystem uh, do we want to practice in the way that, you know, if art is consequential to how we practice our faith, then how do we work that out in our community? You know, that question alone can open up so much. Mm. Mm. Good point. I'm going to stick in a comment too here that, you know, sometimes we see poor aesthetics in churches the way we would see it elsewhere because there's just a limitation of resources. Mm. I mean, it's not that pastors have no sense of what's beautiful. Lots of times they just have no access, and the people that they have within their congregation are not people that are able to produce high levels of art. I've seen this for decades Mm. in churches, and it's not because of They don't have enough funding set aside for beautiful things. They may be working in very poor conditions. And so 
I've seen a tremendous change in the last 20 years in awareness of many churches, at least to do things in a aesthetic and a well-done way. And part of that is the consumer attitude that's now a part mm-hmm. of many congregations. And mm-hmm. that's something that can't be ignored. People are now exposed to levels of aesthetics that they were not 30 mm-hmm. years ago mm-hmm. because of the incredible influx of images in digital media. And as a photographer, I see this issue all the time. So it's something to take a look at that and to say, and maybe even offer a cup full of grace that to give the benefit of the doubt to and, you know, offer help where we can, but accept that it was offered in faith to begin with, whether it was what we think is beautiful or not. It seems like there's a great, a, a great correlation from that to another item on Riken's list of how to make a place unhealthy for artists, and that's to idolize artistic success. Mm-hmm. Add to the burden that artists already feel by only mm-hmm. validating the calling of artists who are, quote unquote, making it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah. you, of course, see this on the pastoral and the celebrity pastor mm-hmm. dynamic or even pastors who have no intention of setting out to be a celebrity and just happen to write some really, really good books that tons and tons and tons of people read. And all of a sudden, to them, that pastor is no longer the shepherd of a flock. He's, on some level, a celebrity, someone that they would line up to go and see. It's almost like you can do this with a person on the artist and you can do this with a person on the pastor and you can do this with the work that they create. You're looking at your church a little bit less as is this beautiful because it's been loved because we are pouring into Mm -hmm. it what we have Mm -hmm. or are you asking that question or are you asking is it instagram worthy is the pastor instagram worthy is the celebrity artist instagram worthy is the church or its music instagram worthy i just keep thinking about the expression about the lord not despising small beginnings and Mm -hmm. that he doesn't despise the small offering that's offered in faith, the woman with the two coins, because that was all she had. And how many times we need to check our motives for why we serve and why we create and why we give. Is it because we love? Is it because we're doing that out of the generosity that the Lord put in our heart? Or is it because we're trying to achieve something different. That's really important, the motive behind it, and to um, listen to that. I agree with that, Lancia. I think that's an excellent point. And to kind of play off of that, I can't help but I think certainly Glenn, uh, give Glenn Powell a shout out here in his book, you know, Saving the Bible from Ourselves, but just thinking about the movement to re-engaging with Scripture in a narrative way. If we are looking at scripture and we're sort of entering into it and into its narrative, the narrative that arises all of the time, constantly throughout sort of the way that God brings to bear his plan with his people is hiddenness. He works through people who are hidden and working through quietness, you know, Rahab and Joseph and Abraham. And, and I mean, I'm just starting in one small portion, I'm just starting in, you know, Genesis, there's plenty of space to continue moving on in that theme throughout the rest of scripture. I mean, the disciples, uh, Jesus in a a small town in, uh, you know, in Galilee, it's, there's this really strong ethos for what it means to, to do goodness in a hidden place. And that's the, you see this throughout all of scripture. And I think that in some sense, as Brian, you were getting at the very beginning, when you were phrasing this question, this is something which is for the scope of the whole church because of the celebrity culture we live in, because of the way that we are all pressured to feel. We're not encouraged to both value our own hiddenness and value it in others. And so it's almost, I think, a something which the church needs to encourage as a conversation on the whole for everybody, artists and pastors and other laity included, you know? The concept of doing our work for an audience of one Mm. is really important. I keep thinking of Lillian uh, Trotter, Mm. who did her best artwork when she was a missionary in Algeria. And she had studied with um, Ruskin in Mm. England, and he believed that she would become the next great European artist, Mm. that she'd surpass him and every other artist in existence at that point in time. And she chose to leave and to go as a missionary where 
no one had gone before, really. And she spent the next 40 years, I believe, in the desert, and she painted her journal Mm. of the life that she lived there. And she did that because she knew she was painting for an audience of one. No one was going to see it except the Lord. And nobody did see it until after she died. Yeah, There was such pure motive in her work. And I think that that's something that'd be really worth looking at. Yeah. And I think there's sort of two things that we could also sort of draw out of this. There's that that aspect, which I think especially for formal artists is, I think you're right, we cannot overemphasize that. That is such a valuable thing to be able to create exactly as you said, in this space of just between you and the Lord and knowing that it is seen no matter what. It's a practice of, it's kind of a practice of the presence of God. It's a practice of saying, I'm aware of God's presence everywhere with me at all times, because even though I'm doing this in quietness, I know that he's there with me. And then I think there's a second aspect to it as well, which is to say hiddenness doesn't always necessarily mean aloneness. I think sometimes it means the quietness of working in the context of a small community. That may mean the whole church. It may mean a few people who are aware. And I think it doesn't have to be practiced purely on an individual level. It can also be opened up into an, into a larger space as well. But it's I think it is a contrasting notion to the idea of being visible and raised up in our culture on the whole. And uh, it's part of that turning the kingdom of God, how the kingdom of God turns things upside down, you know, and it does artistry as well. <laughs> Next thing on uh, Riken's list is when you ask artists to serve through the arts, tell them what to do and also how to do it. Mm. Thoughts? Mm. That's a big one. My wife and I have a joke on uh, projects around the house. I tell her, you can tell me what to do or you can tell me how to do it, but not both. <laughs> <laughs> um, so maybe there's something here that applies. Mm. Um, Just to pick up on that, I, you know, there's an old quote by uh, Stravinsky, and he says, the more that you give me, the, the easier it is for me to write my music. And I just think that's a good way of thinking about artistry is that Part of this is it's something that we, you know, I speak as an artist who has written music for the church and created art for the church, that it's been a benefit to me to have certain kinds of contexts given to me that I'm writing for. It's not been a, a stricture. It, it can be. It certainly can be. There are, I've been in those situations where it just feels like there's a desire for art to serve a purpose and do nothing else. And that is a difficult thing, but it's, there's a balance between structure and freedom within the space of these places of, you know, when we're working with a place of worship or working with our church community, there's something that's going on there. That's more than just us and the freedom of our art. There's a context that we share as a community and that places some, some good guiding lines in place. I think part of that needs to be the understanding. I think that there's more, there's a wider range of purpose to art than just self-expression. Mm. And if a pastor is, um, when I commission work, you know, I commission art from artists from time to time, and I give them some guidelines because I'm looking for something specific because I have a need that needs to be filled for an outreach that I'm doing. And this is especially true when I'm working with artists for cultivating. But the truth is, is that I've done this multiple times too in the church, mm. and it's especially appropriate to offer guidelines to say this is the context of what I'm asking for, but I would certainly never presume to tell somebody that's painting that I want them to paint with acrylic when they're a watercolorist yeah. or yeah. A, when I'm asking a poet like Malcolm Geit to write a technical paper. I mean, it has to be in context of what's being asked for the purpose for which it's needed. And to invite an artist in by giving guidelines is very invitational. It allows them some discipline that many of them don't have. I certainly don't. And I know guidelines help me as a writer. So mm. there's certainly ways to look at that. And I don't think that offering guidelines in context is necessarily an attempt to be domineering or to be expecting an artist to produ produce something by wrote or like a robot. We're not asking that. 
I've seen it done poorly, but it mm. can be done well. Mm. Is there a pretty good correlation here, Father Matt, on the pastor side? Because, I mean, on the one hand, yes, we definitely have conversations pretty regularly with artists who really kind of rebel at the notion of even accepting a commission because they know that it will come with a little bit of a straitjacket. It will come with guidelines. It will come with restrictions. and The expectation just, of discipline, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But assuming that they are uh, open to a little bit more dialogue, you do want to be asked something that's in line with your capabilities, that's in line with the nature of the medium you work in, with what's going on. And right. you want something uh, where it is going to be a constructive dialogue where the whole is better as a result of the dialogue, as opposed to either asking something that's totally inappropriate or on the flip side, offering only restrictions and criticism mm -hmm. with no notion of how hard the job is. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. I guess um, within the pastoral sort of circle of things, one, thanks for, um, thanks for saying that context counts and that being asked to work within a particular context is okay. Mm -hmm. um, because as a pastor, I know this kids, like you alluded to, Lance, you certainly any responsibility and hence authority can be abused, right? But right. any pastor has the responsibility for the entirety of the flock mm -hmm. that Absolutely. they're being fed good, healthful things in every way, including artistic ways. So there's that responsibility to provide context and guidelines. So thanks for that. As far as on the receiving end of that, again, I'm sort of spitballing here, but in my tradition, there are expectations that I will live richly within a context of historic worship, that I will unpack the scriptures well and true to the scriptures and not just to my, the burr under my saddle that week. And so the, I live within those um, that context and those expectations, and happily so, mm -hmm. because it, it, I tell people all the time, the lectionary is a wonderful thing. A, it, there's sort of the miracle of the lectionary, whereby what's scheduled for that Sunday happens to hit what's going on in the world dead center, um, and, which is just the miracle of the lectionary. But also, then you don't get my favorite two dozen scriptures, you know, recycled every two years. Mm -hmm. uh, God forbid, frankly. So the lecture kind of forces the preacher to bring the word right. in ways that are more rich, more full than he might um, mm -hmm. otherwise. Something which I sort of perceived in, in what you're saying, I, I think I will just say this as an artist to other artists that a real value in doing art within the context of the church is patience. Patience to get to know the people that you're part of. Patience to live for a while and to abide and to listen. And that artistry is not just a thing in a vacuum. We don't want to be treated that way as an artist. And so part of it is that to, to allow what we love to do as an artist to flourish and to grow, we have to practice that self-discipline of integration. And because I think that's when I think about context, it's exactly what you were saying. And in addition, it's that being part of regular liturgy and prayer with your community uh, having meals with them, getting to know them, getting to know what drives different people. Though, you know, good artistry comes out of that. Good artistry comes out of the love you have for your community, I think. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I think sometimes, too, you know, the concept of commission. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've recently experienced this in some new ways. But one of the things that strikes me is that the person who's being asked to do something specific is sometimes invited to discover some things about themselves mm. that they would never discover otherwise. Mm. Because sometimes when I'm asking a writer to write about a specific theme, they wouldn't have selected that. Mm. But they end up finding that they know things or that the Lord has been speaking to them in ways that they never would have articulated if I hadn't made that request. And I think that the same can be said for when we ask for things within the church. Mm -hmm. It invites people to step out in discipline into some areas that might never have been explored otherwise. And the Lord increases that and gives them some sort of an amplification of the space. He enlarges their space by working within mm -hmm. the confines of that context. Yeah, Amen. absolutely. Absolutely. There's about a half dozen more things on, <laughs> on Riken's list, but we're about out of time. So if you uh, have appreciated the conversation as far as it's gone, let us know, and we will do another 
episode continuing the conversation. Till then, we are going to call it a day and we will talk to you next time. 